South Africa and welcome to the fourth edition of CoronaCast, your twice weekly information show keeping you up to date with the latest information of what's going on with the coronavirus, what the response is, uh, as well as useful information that you can use during this period, particularly this 21 day lockdown period. Today is day eight of the 21 day lockdown period and obviously uh, a lot of South Africans are adapting to what life is like working from home, uh, having remote workplaces and getting used to this new way of getting things done in South Africa. But please a reminder to all of you to stay home, only leave home for essential uh, work that needs to be done or essential items that need to be bought. Uh, please stay at home so that we can flatten the curve and stop the spread. It's South Africa's best chance of beating the virus. Uh, as you uh, may know, we've had, unfortunately, some deaths during, uh, as a result of the coronavirus. We now have five deaths that have been recorded. And on behalf of the Democratic Alliance, I want to extend our deepest condolences to those families and friends who have lost loved ones as a result of this virus. But what they do do is bring into stark reality that this is a serious challenge facing South Africa and one which we, we must all take seriously if we're going to keep our people uh, safe and to keep the country uh, moving forward. Um, as you know, during the course of these CoronaCast broadcasts, we made a commitment to bring people onto the show who we believe can add value and share information with you experts in their field. And a bit later in the show, I'm going to be joined by the DA Shadow Minister of Justice and Correctional Services, Glynis Breitenbach. She serves as a Member of Parliament but was also uh, worked for many, many years with the National Prosecuting Authority uh, and uh, knows a lot about the law. And we're going to be traversing particularly what your rights are during this 21-day lockdown period. Uh, remember that contrary to what you may have seen from MPs from other parties, the Bill of Rights has not been suspended and that civil, civil liberties remain uh, intact and we need to make sure that they're entrenched. So we want to spend a bit of time on the show today traversing what your rights and your responsibilities are during this term, particularly as it relates to the military. Please remember to that you can continue to submit your uh, questions to the Corona Cast. We broadcast live on a Tuesday and a Friday at 2 p.m. Um, but you can, during the in interim period, you can send through your queries to us and the email address is coronavirus, that's one word, coronavirus, at da.org.za. We also have an informative website which we set up that's dedicated to sharing verified, accurate COVID-19 information. And that can be accessed at www.da.org.za forward slash defeating coronavirus. Please feel free to have a look on that. After each show, we put up a sheet of frequently asked questions. If we haven't had an opportunity to get to your question in the show, uh, please check it out. But there will be a high probability that your question will be able to be answered on that particular frequently asked questions. So, moving now to our daily statistics. Well, we heard yesterday from the Health Minister that South Africa now has 1,462 cases of coronavirus in South Africa. Uh, and this, uh, it seems that the caseload has slowed, and I think we must welcome this. Uh, obviously, these are early days, and we need to remain vigilant and mindful. And it's no re uh, reason why we should be relaxing or uh, slacking off in terms of the requirements of the lockdown. It's essential that if we want to flatten that curve, that we all abide by those regulations. And so I want to remind you during this period, remember, don't panic buy. The food chain is running. Shops will be stocked. There's no need to rush off and, and panic buy. Hi practice hygiene. Use uh, sanitizer with at least an alcohol level above 60%. I think that uh, at the end of the next few weeks, the only alcoholic products are going to be left in many of our homes is actually the hand sanitizers, uh, given the fact that you can't buy alcohol during this period. Uh, but nonetheless, use those hand sanitizers to practice hygiene. If you don't have access to hand sanitizer, ordinary soap for at least 20 seconds, washing your hands so that we can stop the transfer uh, of the spread of the virus. 
and then to ensure that you stay home. It's important that you stay home. Uh, getting out there exposes not only you, but to the people at home, as well as the vulnerable in your households, the elderly or people with compromised immune systems, from being able uh, to beat off the virus. So since our last corona uh, cast, we've had a number of wins uh, around uh, getting the duties lifted on masks, and uh, hopefully we're going to start seeing some masks uh, 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 coming into South Africa. We've noticed there's a shortage of personal protective equipment in our hospitals and I'm very proud of DA MPs and DA public representatives who've been going and sourcing and using their contacts to be able to try and get PPE into the country and into the hands of those people who need it the most. Now um, there's been a bit of a controversial subject and one which we take very seriously here in the Democratic Alliance and that's the protection of civil liberties. What we cannot do during a time of crisis like this is allow authoritarian jackboot behavior to set in and it's been very disappointing to see the work and the uh, behavior of a small group of SANDF, SAPS and Metro Police personnel who have really uh, put the whole uh, sector into uh, a, a, a era of, of suspicion and that is around elements of police brutality, uh, the SANDF and SAPS forcing citizens to perform humiliating acts, uh, people being tortured or shambocked in their own homes, uh, and acts of, uh, of uh, violations of civil liberties. Now, I have no sympathy for people who are defying the lockdown, but that does not give our security personnel the right to simply transverse the Bill of Rights, to ignore what the rights of citizens are. If people are violating the regulations, and the full might of the law must be exercised against them and that they must be charged, prosecuted, imprisoned or fined, but there has to be due process and the rule of law followed. If we go down to using mob justice to solve the situation in South Africa, we're going to end up with war in our streets, not actually against the virus. So we're calling on everybody to cooperate with the SANDF and the SAPS, cooperate with the security services during these times, but at the same time, we're calling on for professionalism and restraint to be shown by our professional uh, and security services in the country. And unfortunately, we've seen a few cases this week where uh, some police personnel were caught on camera joking about how they missed a journalist uh, when they were firing rubber bullets and the like. We've seen the first death as a result of police activity, or allegedly a man was tasered and, uh, and died as a result of that. Uh, these are things which we try and avoid. We've got to work together, South Africa, if we're going to beat this virus. And that means that we've got to have partnership policing, a socio-economic and, and security compact and covenant where we all agree to come together and solve this virus. So in that line, we've launched this week a specialized hotline to be able to report police abuse. So if you are wanting to report humiliation, torture, or overstepping of the mark by any security personnel in South Africa, please SMS us on 067 977 9324, or we've got a dedicated email line where you can do so, and that's report police abuse, one word, at da.org.za. All of those details are up on that uh, website that I shared with you uh, earlier in the day. It's imperative that you know your rights. We've got a few of the frequently asked questions that have come through from viewers at home, and thank you for keeping those coming. I'm going to deal with a few of these here, and then I'm going to hand over to the star of the show today, Glynis Breitenbach. Okay. I've got Spaksky Geldenhuis, who writes here, Are families allowed to travel cross-border for a funeral? Well, the good news, Spaksky, is that this week the regulations were amended, and they now make it possible for family members to attend funerals, even if they are across the border. But that is only for close relatives, and um, it's and only specific people are allowed. The regulations are up on the website, and they set out very clearly what the various circumstances are. So I know that that's come as some relief for people who have had loved ones pass away during this period and who want to be able to pay their final respects. The numbers are still limited to no more than 50 at the funeral. 
Maxi Bardenhorst writes uh, that she's concerned about the rollout of the home-based testing process. She's asking who will be tested, what identification will there be, and how can residents be sure that the person doing the testing is not infected by contact with an infected person? Well, the answer is that the main role of the 10,000 people going out into communities as field workers during this period is to do screening, and they will identify if you need to be tested. They will all carry identification badges and they'll be identified in a, uh, in a, in a specific way. Uh, they will have personal protective wear and importantly, they should be accompanied by a SAPS or security services officer. Rather, don't refuse entry if you are concerned or you have any suspicion about letting them into the house, just politely inform them that is the case and that you'd be happy to answer any questions that they may have through a safe distance, a window, or a locked door. Remember, South Africans, they're rendering a frontline service in an effort to keep us all safe. Atlanta asks, has there been anything implemented to help people in the entertainment industry? I'm a full-time DJ, and this epidemic is hitting me hard. Well, the, uh, uh, Atlanta, the Arts and Culture Department, has reprioritized a budget allocation from quarter one to avail over 150 million rand during this period to be able to assist and provide much needed relief to practitioners in the sector. Helen Carstens uh, says that we are residents of Edgemead and we are currently stuck in Phuket and are unable to return home. We have registered a dilemma with the SA Embassy in Thailand. Well, the government on the 31st of March and through the excellent work by uh, Darren Bergman, uh, one of our DAMPs who's been uh, running a program to get South Africans stuck abroad in a variety of airports back home to South Africa during this period, uh, has been uh, doing excellent work. Uh, the government has made a commitment to getting South Africans home, but for further assistance with the command call centre has been established by government. And the details are, you can call on 012-351-1754 and we are, will continue to keep our channels uh, open during this period. I'm now going to hand over to my friend and guest today, Glynis Breitenbach, who's going to deal with a few of the frequently asked questions that have been identified through emails that you've been sharing with us over the course of this week. And then we're going to take some of the live questions that are coming through for those of you watching the stream. Thank you for staying tuned at this very important uh, Corona cost, and we look forward to sharing some information with you. So, Glynis, thank you very much for making yourself available to be on Corona cost. And um, I'm sure this has uh, been an interesting time for you as well during the lockdown. <laughs> and maybe there's a few things you want to share with viewers at home about what their rights are during this time and any particular questions that you think are relevant at this uh, at this juncture thanks john um, yes there have been uh, there have been a few frequently asked questions uh, and i'll deal with those but as you said the most important thing is for people to stay at home so what people shouldn't be doing is trying to find ways around the lockdown regulations they should be trying to find ways of operating within those regulations and only the exceptions uh, should be made provision for because <coughs> that will keep us all safe. One of the most frequently asked questions are um, how are parents with co-rights and responsibilities over children affected? Can they leave home to take the child to the other parent in terms of a court order or parental agreement? So the short answer is no. At the moment they can't. Um, the minister has um, taken quite a hard line in that regard. I'm not entirely sure that if these um, regulations are challenged in this regard, that they would stand scrutiny. I think they may well be, in certain in certain instances, ultra virus. Um, and I think the overriding issue here should be whether it's safe for the child to be moved or not, whether it's safe for the child to be transported from one parental home to another, um, bearing in mind that the goal here is to not spread the virus. So um, I'm quite sure that if the lockdown um, finishes up on, on the 21st day, this should not be a, a major problem. I think it can be dealt with, but if it extends for much longer than that, uh, I'm sure that uh, some parents will take uh, the issue to court to try and get uh, more clarity. 
um, the regulations um, written in haste and under a lot of pressure, one understands that are not necessarily um, terribly clear with regards to essential issues here. Um, and they're also available for abuse. So, uh, you know, some parents are now uh, using them to keep their children away from from the mm. other parent. Um, often the situation is not a, a friendly, cordial one. There's often a lot of acrimony. Uh, and, and I'm getting a lot of questions from people who, who, who it's clear the, the system is actually being abused. So uh, I've got no doubt that this will um, settle at some point and land up in court. Uh, but the answer to the question at the moment is, no, you can't. <coughs> then another frequently asked question is, what happens to people who cannot pay their maintenance this month due to not having an income? Uh, what should they do to not be found in contempt of court if they don't make a payment? So, you know, the, the initial thing here is always be reasonable and do the responsible thing. If you can pay your maintenance, pay it. If you can only pay a portion of it, pay the portion that you can pay. Um, speak to the person that you pay maintenance to. Tell them what your position is. Explain uh, the difficulties that you're having. You should keep open channels of communication. Um, always be reasonable, always be honest, always be upfront. Um, Maintenance itself is a, a factually determined issue and it depends upon your ability to pay. So if the facts that gave rise to the order being made have changed significantly, then that will be taken into account if at some point in the future you, you charge because you didn't pay. Um, the, but the best thing to do is, is to tell the person that you're paying what your position is and uh, why you're having a difficulty. Um, this is a difficult time for everybody and money is going to be in short supply for a lot of people. So it's going to be very difficult, but uh, if you have no money, you have no money. Yeah. <clears throat> There's nothing that can be done. Um, it might also be wise if you're able to, to send an email to the prosecutor, if you know who the prosecutor is, who deals with your matter, to inform them of your position, just so that you know, everybody can see that you're bona fide in your approach and not, uh, and not uh, just using this lockdown as an excuse to not meet your obligations. <clears throat> Another question similar to this is, what should tenants do if they find themselves unable to pay rent due to loss of income? Well, the same thing. Um, rent is a, is a contractual obligation. Uh, you have to pay your rent. <coughs> um, yeah. So I know this is a big one that's coming well, through for a lot of people, Gladys. All the time. And, um, you know, it is a contractual <laughs> obligation. And I think that what I've been advising people to do is to make contact with your landlord. So don't leave it till uh, the rental is due before you contact your landlord to make some form of uh, contact with them. Uh, send them an email, let them know, and I know this has particularly affected commission-based workers, real estate agents, those who cannot get out in the field to earn their money. I think it's it's quite easy to, to just drop your, your landlord uh, a message, even if you just extend the rental period so that you know he won't necessarily be out of pocket for that particular time, but to try and come to some amicable agreement rather than it just... Um, you know, escalating into a legal battle, which is going to be expensive to resolve. Would you agree that's good? Absolutely, yeah. that's very yeah. good advice. Um, you know, it's, it's always best to be upfront and approach everything in the most um, transparent manner possible. Uh, and and if you're unable to meet your obligations, be upfront about that and explain it, so that you know people don't become angry. There's and there's no bad feeling. Um, everyone is going to have difficulties, and I think everyone understands that. Uh, that doesn't mean that landlords also don't have obligations, of course they do. Uh, and they also have uh, payments to meet, possibly a bond to pay. So, you know, difficulties are going to arise, but the best way of dealing with it is, as you say, up front. <coughs> then a big issue, and you've already touched on it, what are people's rights when they are stopped by the police? And what should they do if they're arrested? Well, as you said, the Constitution has not been suspended, the Bill of Rights has not been suspended. And... Um, that people's liberties have not been suspended. What has been uh, in, encroached upon is their freedom of movement and freedom of association. Um, not suspended, just limited. In terms of the limitations clause, when that's reasonable, given the circumstances, then it's permissible. Um, it doesn't give the police uh, the right to, or the defence force, the right to behave in an authoritarian fashion. Um, the police uh, should remember that they're a police service and not a police force. And there's a distinct difference between the two. 
um, and the idea of a police service is, is one of um, a compassionate, uh, understanding, reasonable approach, a civil approach to, to citizens, to, to treating them in the best possible way and to be of assistance to them, not, uh, not to be authoritarian and, and harm them. <coughs> I've just had uh, I've just had a, a message come through here from a Amantle from Rustenburg who said Glynis that she was uh, assaulted, slapped hard by a member of the SAPs in front of other people um, for no other reason while she was out obviously trying to go and get food. Um, obviously, this is a type of case we need to admit uh, to to avoid. And Certainly. what would the advice so, be in this regard? Well, um, that, that if if there was. Uh if, if she was out for a reason, and a, and a reason that's permitted in terms of the regulation, so to go and buy food is, is such a legitimate reason, then all she needs to do really is to, when asked what you're doing, you must explain. If the explanation is a reasonable one, it should be accepted. Um, a, a police officer slapping a citizen is um, simply never acceptable. Uh, cannot possibly be allowed, and, and the deployment of the police and the defense force is done uh, with the idea that the minimum amount of force should be used at all times. Um, that is, a, that is an, a, an instruction that the police have in any event. Uh, it is always a minimum amount of force required situation. So slapping a citizen is, is unacceptable. It can never be, it can never be justified. And um, this uh, lady should go to the police station. She should depose to an affidavit. Um, she should lay a charge of assault, and she should, if she has witnesses, um, ask them if they're prepared to uh, also make statements. Um, preferably not all at the same time in the same room, uh, because of course we don't want people crowding together. But um, she certainly does have the basis there for, if those are the facts, uh, the basis for a charge of assault to be laid against the policeman. And she should also um, log it with our complaint line yeah. so that we can take it up uh, on her behalf. Yeah. And Claire, as well, just to remind you, uh, if you're watching at home, the we've got the WhatsApp line, the number is 067-977-9324. Alternatively, you can email us the details, and that's reportpoliceabuse at da.org.za. And I just want to be clear, we're not giving people a license to be rude or unhelpful or uncooperative. We've got to have a partnership. It means that both sides have a responsibility in how they behave. When, when people um, are stopped in the street, when, when uh, the police stop into question, I mean, the big thing to remember is this is new for everybody. It's new for the police, it's new for the army, it's new for us. Uh, everybody is a little under pressure, everybody's perhaps a little frightened. Uh, the best approach is always the civil one. So be, re be reasonable, be civil, explain yourself in a civil fashion. Um, aggression gets neither party anywhere and it should be avoided at all costs. Um, don't provoke the police or the army, they are working under a lot of pressure and they are also afraid, they are afraid of getting the virus, they are out there doing a, a job that they are not really trained to do and uh, so it's difficult for everybody. The best approach is to be civil and be reasonable and try your best to not be rude and provocative and aggressive. Um, and that advice goes to the police and the army as well. There's no excuse for them to be any of those things. And if everybody approaches in that fashion, we should have a lot less problems. Uh, but, but if you are arrested during the lockdown period, um, then of course you, all the rights that you have in terms of the Constitution and the Bill of Rights are, are still there for you. Um, you have the right to human dignity, you have to be treated uh, in accordance with the Constitution, you're entitled to legal representation. Um, all of those things uh, are still available to you and you should demand all of your rights. So there's nothing to be afraid of if you're arrested. It doesn't mean for the next 21 days you're stuck in a cell somewhere, not at all. Um, there are many avenues available to you. And wh what people shouldn't do is they should not allow themselves to be humiliated. Mm -hmm. We've seen videos, fortunately there's only a few and I'm not suggesting that it's the general behavior. I'm sure it isn't. But we have seen videos of people being shambled, people being asked to do push-ups, mm. people rolling around, and it's just unacceptable. Yeah. It cannot be excused to humiliate uh, citizens like that, and they shouldn't accept that kind of uh, behaviour. If, if you need to be warned, the police must warn you. If you need to be fined, they must fine you. And if they feel they must arrest you, then they must arrest you, and then you have all of those rights. Mm. 
but rolling around in the dirt, doing bunny jumps, it's just not yeah. uh, acceptable. Curtis, we've got a request here, and this has also been a thorny issue that a lot of the people at home have been struggling to traverse and lots of conflicting answers. And that's about estate living and what rights people have on an estate to be able to walk out and about. Um, have you dealt with this? And uh, I know that the, the minister put out some uh, interesting information around that. Um, practically, how, po how possible is it to stop people from walking around the estates? And surely here the big thing to to be policing is social distancing. Sure. Well, you know, the fact that you live in an estate doesn't give you any more or less rights than any other citizen in South Africa. So the object of the lockdown uh, regulations and the, and then the declaration of a state of disaster is to keep people at home. The, the goal of a lockdown is to keep you in your home, stay in your premises, your residential premises. The fact that you live in an estate doesn't exempt you from that. So if you live in a house, you can't walk up and down the street. If you live in an estate, you can't walk up and down the estate. Uh, the fact that it can't be policed as effectively is so. So you can possibly do it and get away with it. But that isn't the purpose of the lockdown, and you shouldn't be trying to find ways to circumvent the lockdown. Uh, as you said in the beginning, the lockdown is designed to protect all South Africans from the spread of the virus. So when you are walking around the estate, um, it's prob probably so that you can get away with it because it will be more difficult to see you and stop you. Mm. But it doesn't mean that you're allowed to do it, you're not. You, when it says stay in your house, it means stay in your house. Mm. And social distancing, yes, um, that should always be practiced, but that's, that doesn't give you the excuse to walk around the estate. In, in actual fact, what you're doing is you're putting yourself, mm. and more importantly, other people at risk. Sure. Um, and so, really, people should not be trying to find ways to circumvent the lockdown regulations, they should be finding ways to operate within them because it's in the interests of everybody, including themselves. Debbie Donaldson had in geschreven and says by the comment over her water problem in her gemeenskap. Uh, Debbie, I can for you say the first thing that you must do is uh, for your raadslid uh, a bell to give and to say what the problem is. Our raadslid around the land um, uh, is there om to help. In jullie moet hulle nommers kry, jy kan van die DA um, webpage ook kry, um, maar our councillors are out there to help communities. If you are without water, uh, there's been a fault, a municipal fault on your property during this time, um, those services are regarded as essential services. So please get hold of your councillor or the local municipality and they will be able to help you solve that water problem, Debbie, and I hope it works out well for you there. Um, Glynis, I mean, there are any of the other ones that have come through there while I... Sure, there's a lot of questions, of course, about funerals and the yeah. movement of, of um, the mortal remains of people who have died. Uh, what can and can't you do during the lockdown period? Fortunately, those regulations have been relaxed quite considerably now and have been made a lot clearer. So uh, now you can cross provincial boundaries. Uh, to attend a funeral, you can cross provincial boundaries to move uh, the remains of somebody who has died. Um, the regulations make it clear that in the vehicle moving the mortal remains of somebody can only be two people and they must be family members of the deceased person. Um, funerals are limited to 50 people. Uh, no night vigils are to be held. Um, but you can get, now you can get permission to cross provincial borders in order to attend a funeral, which wasn't so at the beginning of the lockdown. And there's a, a, a category of people who are allowed to attend the funerals and it's in the regulations, it's very clear. Um, and they are reasonably broad, I think, generously making provision for for most people who should be wanting to attend a funeral. Right, here's a very interesting one that's come through and one that's exercising a lot of people's minds. I've been getting a lot of WhatsApps uh, about this and this is the whole issue of cigarettes, the sale of tobacco uh, during the period. A lot of people not understanding why there was a decision to lock down on, on alcohol and cigarettes. Uh, and then also, has government waived the Bill of Rights in terms of the lockdown? So let's deal with those two quickly. Okay, well, cigarettes are, are, are not for sale simply because they can't be classed as essential goods. So it's not, they're not basic goods, they're not essential uh, products, and so that is the reason why they're not being sold. That being said, uh, the regulations are a little ambivalent, uh, a little vague. They can be interpreted in more than one way. 
And uh, so, for instance, in the Western Cape, uh, cigarettes are being sold, um, but only when you're buying your groceries. So you can buy groceries and you can buy cigarettes when you buy them. Um, and I've heard that uh, Mr. Taylor say that the Western Cape thinks it's above the law and they can't be doing this well. I beg to differ. Uh, I think that the regulations are, in that respect, um, ambiguously drafted that the provision is available for more than one interpretation. And, and so there's absolutely legally nothing wrong with what the Western Cape is doing. Um, but it is so that, of course, cigarettes could probably not be classed as essential goods. So I've got a very interesting one here from um, Aisha, who says that she really enjoyed watching the videos of people being forced to roll around in the dirt and to made to perform these humiliating acts. Well, um, you know, these things may be amusing to some South Africans, but my question always is to people like you, Aisha, is what if that was your mother or father that had been unfairly stopped on a street while going to perform a function to get food or to access medical care, or one of your children that gets, un that gets stopped at the side of the road and made to perform these humiliating functions? I would tend to think that your response uh, would move very quickly from amusement to absolute uh, horror and disgust. Um, these sorts of things are not accepted. And the big thing, Aisha, that we need to really guard against, while well, it may be short-term amusing for people like you to watch these videos, um, is that what you don't want is the temporary to become the permanent. And once the security services and the autocrats get a taste for this type of behavior going forward, um, it can very, very easily uh, escalate. And it starts with frog jumps and making people roll around on the ground and these forms of humiliation. History shown as always ends in a far more sinister space. So uh, you find these videos and these sorts of things happening uh, amusing because they're happening to other people. Uh, I would venture to say that I think you would have a completely different view of this if it was happening to members of your own family um, as a result of unfair unauthorized action. Um, got here. Um, yes, Jared Hemingway, I uh, noticed that the clock uh, is there. This is a set that we're using uh, for Corona cost, but uh, as is your special request, if I can get some batteries in this day of lockdown, I'll make sure that we put some batteries in the clock there, but at least it is right twice a day. Um, so thank you very much for bringing that to our attention. I'm very glad you're paying, uh, you're paying close watch to what's happening here on Corona Cost. Uh, Glynis, here's an interesting one from Werner. What if you've been summoned to appear in court and you, you, you've got a summons date and, and you've got a court date? What do you do now? Well, the, the minister has issued directions, and, and so have all the heads of courts. <coughs> Excuse me, and the, the directions are quite clear. Only urgent matters are being dealt with. And uh, if you've been summoned, it's unlikely that it's an urgent mat matter, because that's one of the, the least invasive methods of securing your attendance at court. So um, people have been told not to come. Uh, all the workings have been suspended, and you won't be, there will be no consequence for you not appearing uh, at this time um, because of the lockdown. So if you have a summons to appear in court, once the lockdown lifts, you should go straight to the court and determine what a new date would be. Uh, if you do go to court on the date of, that you've been summoned to go, it's likely that at the door you'll be given a new generic date to which everyone else is being postponed. Um, so, so you have choices, but again, similarly to the maintenance matter, if you have the contact details of the prosecutor, which should be on the summons, uh, the, the name and the telephone number of the prosecutor should be on the summons, and also the name and the telephone number of the investigating officer of the matter should be on the summons, uh, you should call them and make an arrangement over the phone, or email them and make an arrangement by email, so that you don't go to court, because the idea is to have as few people as possible going to court. Uh, but the consequences of not appearing so contempt of court, that kind of thing, will, will, will be suspended by the lockdown period. Sure. Um, but it shouldn't be used as an excuse by people to then try and evade uh, the, the uh, date with justice. Uh, if they have a summons and if they're unable to go to court, 
now because of the lockdown. They must try and make another arrangement. And if they're unable to, on the first possible date when lockdown is lifted, they must go to the court, present themselves, and ask for a new date. Uh, what they shouldn't do is try to avoid them going to court at all, because then, um, then they will be viewed in a, in a different light uh, and will be much less accommodating. Great. Thanks, Glynis. And uh, we've got a great one here from uh, Elzan who said that she was stopped on the Kuburg Road this morning uh, and she had a very pleasant experience. So it just shows you that uh, there are the security personnel, but I think by far the majority of the security personnel understand what they need to do and are going about their duties in a professional way. So let's cooperate with the authorities. Let's make sure that we comply with what's expected of us and we don't abuse the, the regulations. Glynis, that's all we've got time for this week, so I want to say thank you very much for joining us. Remember, ladies and gentlemen, that at the end of the show, they'll be up on the DA website, www.da.org.za, slash uh, defeating coronavirus, one word. There'll be a, fre a frequently asked questions uh, sheet that Glynis has put on. We update it regularly as new regulations come out and as we start to interpret these regulations more. Now, next week on the show, I've got on Tuesday, I've got Zach Mbele, our small business manager, um, MP, and Jordan Hill Lewis is our shadow MP for finance. And they're going to be here unpacking the SMME fund. I see there's still questions coming through from people. How do they access the fund? What are the criteria? We're going to get to the bottom of those next week and share that information with you. So if you're a small business or you know someone who's a small business, Please tell them to tune in on Tuesday at 2 o'clock so we'll be able to answer all the questions. If you've got questions, send them through in the meantime to coronavirus at da.org.za and what, uh, what that enables us to do is to pre-prepare answers for you so that we can make sure you've got the facts at your fingertip. Again, I want to say a huge thank you to those on the front line fighting the virus. Our SAPS, our SANDF personnel, our Metro Police officers, our nurses and our doctors. Uh, we are really grateful for the work that you're doing and the risk that you're taking to keep all of us safe. So thank you very much again to our farmers and farm workers who are keeping the food chain going and keeping our stores stocked up so that we don't run out of the essential goods that we need. Thank you very, very much for the work that you're doing. And then finally, to you at home, South Africa. For those of you who are abiding by the lockdown, Remember, flatten the curve, stop the spread, stay at home, and I look forward to seeing all of you next week on Tuesday at 2 p.m. for that special broadcast on small businesses and how to access the funds. Thank you very much for watching. We hope you've enjoyed it. Thank you, Glynis, for being with me here today. Uh, and obviously, we'll continue to bring you people who have got expert advice to be able to answer some of your questions during this very uncertain time. Be safe out there, South Africa. We're going to get through this and we're going to get through it together.